Chapter 8. Alienation We are alienated in many ways, from our jobs, our democracy, our emotions, and each other. Alienation is the cause of the widespread malaise that has so many people taking tranquilizers, antidepressants, and other mood-altering substances. Most see their malaise as personal and do not realize that it is a shared problem. The feminists of the 1970s saw how the different kinds of alienation were interconnected. They called for an end not just to sexism, but to patriarchy, authoritarianism, militarism, capitalism, and other ills in our society. They saw all of those tied together. They sought an end to alienation. I'm sorry to say that feminism has lost much of that vision. Today, feminism usually just means giving women an opportunity to participate equally in the alienation, in illegal wars, and in the corporatist plundering of the commons and the middle class. Today, hardly anyone is talking about the broader vision. More than its inefficiencies, injustices, and inconsistencies, the most fundamental drawback of our market-based culture is its teaching us to suppress and disregard our empathy, and to see other people solely in terms of what use they will be to us. We are alienated from each other. Our economic system teaches us separateness. Our dwellings are arranged as separate economic units. You keep your stuff in your house, I keep my stuff in my house. Your loss is not necessarily my loss, and might even be my gain. Keep the homeless where I won't have to see them. The little that remains of the commons is not being protected. Instead, it is being neglected into disrepair, or privatized and plundered into ecocide. We are seldom reminded of any shared purpose that might unite us. We come to see ourselves and others merely as shoppers and commodities. Lacking any meaning in our lives, we are hypnotized by consumerism, which can't fulfill us. Our lack of concern for others goes further to a blame-the-victim attitude that has become commonplace in our society. It's a form of denial. It may be easier to say that someone deserves the ill treatment they are getting than to admit to yourself that their treatment is unjust, that you were powerless to do anything about it, and that you yourself may soon share the same fate. Our enormous economic inequality contributes greatly to our alienation. We are taught to compete against each other and to value ourselves according to our salaries, and so we are stratified into ranks. This erases any notion of shared goals, destroys trust and solidarity, and creates psychological stress that is medically harmful, even for the wealthy, for they can only become and remain wealthy by being obsessed with wealth and cutting themselves off from empathy. It's a vicious circle. Our ideological system and our economic system are both alienated, and each perpetuates the other. If you're watching my video, you may want to pause on this slide and the next one to look at them carefully. Francis Moore LaPay has explained in more detail how the different parts of our alienation perpetuate each other. She calls it a spiral of powerlessness. She urges us to replace it with a spiral of empowerment. If you're reading the transcript page, at this point you'll find a link to a lecture by Francis Moore LaPay. Somehow, separateness has become our only acceptable religion, despite our society's claim of ecumenicism. Separateness even has its own prophet, the sociopath Ayn Rand, who preached that selfishness is good. Political debates on television are only between different versions of separateness. Any other view is dismissed as dictatorship. Do you see this glass as half full or half empty? And concerning human nature, which is more realistic? Optimism, that is to build more schools, or pessimism, to build more prisons? For a glass, half full and half empty are equally accurate observations. But for human nature, it's not a matter of observation. It's a matter of what we choose to be, what we aspire to become. Sometimes culture has changed, and with conscious effort we can change it further. If we put our minds to it, surely we can find a better way to live. 
The pessimistic worldview does contain a small grain of truth. None of us want to be taken advantage of, and a few of Reagan's mythical welfare queens really do exist, though the free riders on Wall Street are a far greater burden on our society. The most frequent criticism of socialism that I've heard is that if all people were guaranteed an income, they'd immediately stop working, and the economy would collapse. And I'll grant that the economy would in fact collapse, if nothing else were changed aside from the distribution of money. To make any kind of socialism work, we'd also have to make other changes that are much bigger, and much harder to visualize. We'd have to change our notion of community, so that people felt they belonged to it, and wanted to contribute to it, and could depend on it to take care of them in turn. And we'd have to change our jobs so that they were meaningful. A few of us do have meaningful jobs. The teacher, nurse, and firefighter might feel appreciated for their work. It gives them a feeling of connection to the community. They take home from their workplace more than just a paycheck. But most of our jobs are more like that of the assembly line worker portrayed by Charlie Chaplin in his film Modern Times. They're repetitive, mechanical, anonymous, easily replaced, and without any purpose that is experienced by the worker. But a different and better world is possible.